Welcome everybody to today's Casus Institute seminar. We have uh, uh, Jeromino Castrillon, Castrillon, how you pronounce it? <laughs> yeah. uh, here in, in Görlitz. Welcome, Jeronimo. Um, he is, uh, is currently uh, he owns the chair for compiler construction in at the uh, Center um, for Adva Advancing Electronics in Dresden. The you, you know it as CFAED, probably. Um, he is originally from uh, from from Colombia. Um, moved then uh, to to Switzerland. He said to, to the to the uh, Italian uh, side of Switzerland uh, to do his PhD there. Masters. Yeah. The masters. Okay, the, the PhD then at, at in Aachen at the RV at the, uh, Aachen. Okay, so he's been quite a while in uh, in Europe and then also in German uh, uh, in Germany. We've been talking in German, and he's really fluent in, in German. So uh, maybe I shouldn't say that because everyone German will approach you in German now. <laughs> um, yes, and uh, then in um, he was a postdoc for for a couple of years, um, and uh, in Aachen University from 2019 to 2013, and then in 2014 um, uh, he came to Dresden, right? Uh, to join the Department of Computer Science at the TU Dresden as a professor for compiler construction. And back then, this uh, CAAFD was, uh, the FAED uh, was in a German Excellence Cluster, right? And um, this has been now um, kind of more stabilized, you can say so. Uh, and uh, he's working still in Dresden. Um, he has a group of 12 people now. Uh, and we are actually excited to get to know him and his work there. And um, you have the link. You have the link uh, to see all his publications and and and, and the distinguish, distinguish, distinguishments uh, in the email. So have a look there. We will now hear from 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 Geronimo uh, about his work. I think this is why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let me see if I can share this. Um... Okay, I hope uh, the sharing is working. Um, yeah, so first of all, then uh, thanks, thanks a lot for the for the kind words, Michelle, for the invitation, Martin, also for the, the introduction, and also to Justin for the walk through the city and then to get to know the what is the, the campus here, which is the whole all, 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 all city center. Um, so it's very nice to be here. So yeah, my name, the correct pronunciation would be Jeronimo Castrillo. So you were Close, close. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as in Spanish, um, and yeah, with the computer science department, the addressing um, it's a bunch of affiliations, right? Um, and then you have let me put the laser. Then you have this CFAD, which is a mouthful, as you could see in the in the introduction. So we call it sometimes CFED, Center for Advanced Electronics Express, and CFED, um, which is now uh, yeah, an entity. What used to be an excellent cluster now is an entity within uh, the university. Uh, so yes, I'm going to be talking about domain-specific programming methodologies for domain-specific computing platforms. Um, so the, the idea, so as, as was it mentioned in the introduction, is that I do compilers, also programming languages, and I am particularly interested in um, like emerging computing platforms. I'm going to give you a bit of taste of what, what I mean with that in, in some of the slides. So let me get started with um, a bit of motivation, what motivates the research that we do in my, my team. Um, so, as you all know, since the mid of 2000, 2005, more or less, we started getting multi cores. So, with multi cores came a bunch of uh, challenges in terms of how we program systems. We used to have only single core architectures in most of the computing systems, and then suddenly we had multi cores, and a lot of people were confronted with, with threats, uh, concurrency issues, and these kind of things, and that, that posed challenges for compilers, languages, and this kind of research. Um, then we got this phenomenon, which is called a start silicon, right? So you couldn't really put all the all your energy into the transistors that you had on the chip because the chip would would, would melt down. Uh, so that's how it came to specialization. So we get we have today a bunch of specialized um, architectures in our systems, like TPUs and the like. Um, and sometime uh, in the near future. Uh, and it's already happening today, people started talking about post-simons. And that was actually one of the motivations for CFIT, right? To 
investigate what kind of technologies will help us keep scaling computing systems. And POSIMOS is for silicon kind of computers. And, and you have heard of, of some of these, of course, like quantum computing, um, um, I don't know, adiabatic computing, computing with oscillating lasers, uh, maybe less exotic things like silicon nanowires have been now produced, uh, also interested in molecular computing, DNA storage. There's a lot of technologies that will make our computing systems more exciting, but also more challenging to, to work with. So here are examples of what I, what I, was, saying, what I was saying before about the specialization. So today we have uh, TPUs, tensor person units in different variants, right? like the Google ones, the NVIDIA ones, and, and AMD uh, has um, now AI engines because AMD acquires silings. There's a lot of accelerators for bioinformatics. Um, there's also novel interconnects and um, ways of doing distributed computing, even uh, even in, in systems that used to be very isolated. Like uh, here, the keyword would be cyber physical systems. They are distributed and they are time critical. So there's a lot of programming challenges here. And um, today, I think it's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest, and I think it's very interesting to look into emerging memories and also this trend towards uh, near memory computing or in memory computing. Like like how do you if you have a three D stacked memory, uh, what kind of logic, what kind of computation you can do close to the memory so you don't have to bring data uh, to the to the scene. OK, so these are just some images of, of things that relate to what I was just saying before. Um, AI accelerators we have all over the place. Then this is a this is a prototype from Stanford using carbon nanocubes, like a 3D stack system integration, which is very interesting and just shows like what possibilities are there with novel technologies. And what you see here at the bottom are um, emerging spintronics based memories. And if time allows, I'll just say something about that. Um, anyway, so, and then on the other side, so we have all this evolution in hardware. On the other side, we have, of course, a lot of um, interesting applications that requires this new hardware, like uh, physics simulations. Uh, we, we work on, we work with people doing physics simulation. We work with people doing autonomous driving and autos are here. Is a, is a consortium mostly led by the German industry. And of course, AI and NML, right? So this is, this is pushing a lot of things. And, and so one, one thing that I, that I really like in doing my research is to kind of profit from all the, the hype, so to speak, in ML, like accelerator for ML, all these tensor processing units, all these AI engines for AMD, IBM also just published some, some, some architectures. Uh, that of course are for kind of linear algebra and maybe some 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 nonlinearities in, in the deep neural networks of today. Uh, but I think it's, it's it's very interesting to see how can we transparently with compilers with languages how we can transparently also use those new types of architectures for applications that are maybe not the ones that are fueling this development. Right. So you have all this investment in ML. Can we use that for some weather simulations? Right. Can we can we automatically transform? <coughs> more efficiently using those accelerators for ML, even if they were not meant to be uh, to accelerate into weather simulations or, or other types of computer simulations. Okay, so yeah, so the bottom line, the things are very complex, so programmers are desperate. Um, and so what motivates kind of my research is that there is this so-called golden era in computer architectures so that has been coined by by Turing Award laureates. Um, Patterson, Hennessy and Patterson a couple of years ago. So you have, we have this golden era in computer architecture. And I, what, I, what I think is that we need also kind of a golden area in, in programming abstractions and what I call toll-free abstractions. And maybe I will talk about that. Um, programming abstractions, compilers, methodologies, so that we can actually more transparently uh, use these kind of heterogeneous emerging computing systems for, for multiple domains, not only machine learning. Um, Right, so in, in our case, what that means is that we want these high-level program abstractions. We need kind of a next generation of compilers, high-level compilers. And we also need uh, people and that, that are people in my group doing this, but also people in the community looking at these new computational models, these new computational paradigms, and understanding what are the costs models that will help us understand what is it that we cannot optimize. Right? So this, this, now we, we understand CPUs, and even if we understand CPUs, it's very difficult to, to optimize for them. Now we don't understand these new systems. We need to understand them so, so that we can actually properly accelerate for them. Okay, so this is kind of what uh, motivates some of the research that we're doing in my group. So I will not talk about the different aspects that we address here. I'll, I'll try to focus on, on DSLs, as I, as I mentioned in the title, and uh, then give you a little bit of insight into emerging technologies. 
So let's motivate this, this, this need for abstractions. And, and I'll start with this expression here. So that expression there is, a, is an interpolation, uh, which can be written in tensor form, and we're going to see that in a minute. And if, um, if you go and write this naively in C or C++, so you will produce this kind of code here. So this is a very easy to read code, and it's actually just kind of a direct implementation uh, of this thing here. And we have these four-dimensional kernels, uh, these four-dimensional tensors, and you have these matrices, and you just have the multiple implementation. And so if, if you are really a naive programmer, you would write something like this. Uh, I guess people here would know better and would not, would not write something like this. But what is surprising is the, um, the performance differences between this code and, and the code that a compiler will, will create. And the reason for that is because the compiler, once you give this code to the compiler, the, compilers, the compiler model of this code will be something like this. And this is an actual compiler graph that has been simplified so that it can fit into this, into this line. So it's very tough for the compiler. Out of all these edges and, and nodes and, and so on, it's very difficult to reconstruct the mathematical expression that is actually being implemented here. And as a consequence, if you run this compiler through today's through this code through today's compilers, there's going to be a hundred times slower than compared to a very good, a very well written implementation of the same operator. Right? This is a numerical kernel, and if you write it properly with OpenMP fragments for SIMD and for parallelism, um, then the, the, the speed up is of 100 gigs just in a CPU, right? Uh, and so that's that's what I mean with we need some abstractions that we keep information of, of what is it that we want to compute so that we can optimize properly. And um, and so if we cannot really do it, if we cannot expect a compiler to take this piece of code and optimize it by this 100 times into a traditional CPU. So it's very hard to imagine how will a compiler be able to take this abstraction and lower it to a TPU, lower that into an in-memory accelerator like this one here is supposed to, um, it's supposed to represent an in-memory computing with memory stiff technologies represented by IBM a couple of years ago, or uh, with a modern FPGA board. So this is an LBAO board with high bandwidth memory where you can actually stream a lot of data into the FPGA fabric. So it's very difficult to imagine if we cannot make it for a CPU, how can we make it to these uh, emerging uh, computing systems? So that's where kind of DSLs come in. So uh, I, I like DSLs. I also like traditional compilers and things like polyhedral compilers, trace-driven trace -driven dynamic parallelization, uh, idiom and motif ex extraction. So how, how can I take a piece of C or C++ code and automatically identify does this, that this actually is a something simple, like a map reduce kind of pattern. And there's a lot of work in that in those areas, and I, I like those works as well. But I'm a big advocate of, of domain-specific abstractions, maybe not necessarily languages, because there is always kind of a pushback when you say a new language, right? So there's a lot of languages. It doesn't have to be a language. It's just, you just have to understand what are, what are the abstractions that you require. Um, and then about the language or the syntax or how to integrate that into, into a, I don't know, Fortran code bases, then there are engineering ways to, to kind of solve those you know, interoperability issues. Um, okay, so what is a DSL? <clears throat> so this is a figure that I stole from a paper uh, from last year, in one of the better compiler uh, conferences. So this is kind of showing the, the levels of abstraction, right? And the, the higher you go, uh, the idea here is that the higher you go, the more fun you can have <laughs> going down the hill in terms of performance. And so DSLs will be something here on the top where you have a very high level of abstraction of what is it that you want to describe with your programming language. And then you have uh, languages like C++, which are very low level, like closer to, to what machine code will eventually look like. Um, there are people that are, that are trying to work on how to um, raise the level, of, the level of abstraction. And for instance, with idiom extraction, like for instance, I give you a piece of C++ code and the compiler automatically recognizes that what is going on here is that there is a tensor contraction. And there is actually solid work doing these kinds of identifications. Uh, but yeah, DSLs kind of avoid having to do that by just defining the abstraction directly. Um, and so the idea of DSLs is that they help you bridge the gap between domain experts, maybe people that are not experts C++ or Fortran programmers, and, um, and, and high performance computing systems. Uh, and there's a bunch of examples of what DSLs are. Um, in the area of image processing, Halide is a very, is a very successful DSL. Spiral is, a, is an old DSL. Uh, that was very successful in, in generating efficient implementations of many linear transformations. And then you have the machine learning frameworks like TDM, TensorFlow, Tensor Comprehensions, 
which yeah, they aren't. This it's not like a new syntax because they're they're using Python. Um, but what, by, by using Python, you are creating those abstractions. You're creating abstractions for layers. You're creating abstractions for um, operators, types of convolutions, types of pooling, types of these kind of things that you have in, in machine learning. And you have um, Fire Drake as an example of a DSL for finite element methods. So there's a lot of DSLs out there. Um, and maybe in the discussion, we'll come to, uh, to, 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 the, to the questions about yeah, how useful are how useful are these things, how, how easy it is to really integrate that into, into yeah, I don't know, Fortran code bases or Python code bases. Okay, so before we go there, uh, I'll, I, I said I will bring some examples. So this is the one that I was discussing before with Michel. So we've been working with Ivo Valsarini on particle mesh simulations. And so this is uh, actually a paper from Ivo's group of SBM. So this is this library for particle methods. And I guess people here would know more about particle mesh simulations than I do. Um, Evo always says that uh, particles uh, are, are very interesting because they allow you to model discrete continuous things and deterministic and stochastic phenomena. So it's a very generic uh, kind of framework for simulating uh, physics. Um, and together with, with Evo and, and people working like domain experts, like really people that are maybe not computer scientists, we have uh, been working for I don't know, four years now in, into a, a syntax. Uh, it has been a bit slower than I, than I had expected, but at least today we have a, a syntax that uh, at least I think is, is very cool. There's been some iterations, but as I said, the syntax is to me a little bit secondary to the abstractions that we want to be able to express. And here you see an example of of DSL that actually looks very close to domain expert, right? You're writing differential equations. Uh, so this would be an example of a continuous, a continuous uh, model. And uh, there are there is also syntax to define uh, discrete models, like here, for instance, you define them a set of particles, and then you just define um, the interact and evolve uh, methods, right? So the two primitives that allow you to, to kind of advance the simulation. And, um, and from these kind of abstractions where you only have interact and evolve, uh, the compiler can, for instance, automatically insert um, Ghost synchronization layers, right? Because we know when things will be used, when, when they will be needed. So we can automat automatically insert those. I don't really know if that is something that, that is a huge problem. So I can imagine that if you don't know anything about um, synchronizing the Gauss layers, that you may get into, into errors, but I don't know if that's something that happens in practice. But anyway, for the compiler, it's easy to insert those cost synchronization layers. And, and for instance, we can also, if you have a hybrid model in which you have some things are, are, are simulated on the particles and some things are simulated on the mesh, you always have to kind of uh, switch back and forth between, between the representations for which you need interpolation. And, and that's also something that can be can be implicit in, in, in the code, right? You don't have to write it. The compiler would recognize it and insert it. Okay. So yeah, so as I said, we target, so we generate code. So this is a source to source compilation. So we have this DSL, and from this DSL, we generate code for, for the OpenFPM library. And I think the OpenFPM library is a, is, a, is a very interesting, very good redesign of what existed before, which was a Fortran library. Um, this was, this C++ library was mostly implemented by Pietro. Who is going to defend his PhD soon? Uh, I guess he, is. Huh? he has handed in at least. Right. <laughs> he will defend, I think, in two weeks or something. Uh -huh. um, so it's a modern C plus plus template library. Um, but now, still, there, there are some uh, there are some caveats with this library. So if, if this is what you want, like like before, this is a mathematical expression, very easy to write. Um, if you go and write it in in OpenFPM, you end up with um, this type with this code, and this is actual code to implement this thing. And what you see here is that it is 3D. So you have uh, here the X, the Y, and the Z coordinates. Um, and I think you don't have to know a lot about programming. I mean, if you know template metaprogramming, you would recognize that there are many, many hard things to understand in this piece of code. And when you do template metaprogramming and you have a mistake, it's really difficult to track down what that mistake was. And in particular, this piece of code lends itself very nicely for copy-paste errors, right? Because you write the one dimension, then you copy-paste it into the second one. And, you, and if you forget to change one x for c, um, it's going to be tough to, to, to find those, those things, right? And, and I think that's where, where high-level abstractions really help avoiding those errors in the first place. Um, OK, so how did we, how did we go about uh, this cooperation? Um, we do what is called a model-to-model -model code generation. 
So we are translating in from, from a DSL into this OpenFPM library, but we're not doing that, um, yeah, like, like just creating text, right? So our compiler creates text. But what the, what the compiler does is that it first has, uh, when we write the DSL, this DSL is actually populating a model of, of the simulation. Uh, and then this goes into a like, traditional compiler, so it goes to an uh, intermediate representation that we have. Um, and then this will this this IR will be linearized according to the OpenFBM model. And so this is a little bit of compiler jargon to say that uh, by doing this model to model translation, so there is a model of what the library supports. So when we when we export this internal representation into code, uh, we are sure, I mean, not hundred percent, but ninety nine point nine percent sure that what we are producing is legal code. And that is something that uh, often when, when you work with DSLs, when we work compilers, that's often that, uh, something that is often neglected, um, that you, you you write your compiler just by, just if you know, uh, printfs, right? So you just write printfs into a file uh, and it's very dangerous to produce text because there is no, you're, you're producing text with no syntax or semantic checking. So in this, in this, in this compiler, we, when we create code, this is syntactically and semantically correct. So we, we are not, we're trying not to produce an error. And um, I think what uh, the, the key point here is that uh, when we produce DSLs, we want these DSLs to be, uh, not to leak in their abstractions. And maybe let me explain what I mean by that. Today, if you, if you write C code uh, or C++ code, you as a programmer will not, you, you do not expect to have to go and debug the assembly code that is generated, right? You write C++ code, the compiler produces assembly code, and the thing runs. So you will not expect to be, to be confronted with having to debug the assembly code. But that's something that happens today in, in many DSLs. You write a DSL, uh, you get C++ out, and then something is broken in the C++ that you generated. So if you've never seen the C++ code, it's very tough for you to debug the C++ code, right? Or the interfacing between the C++ and the Fortran world. And that's something that we try to avoid by, by doing this kind of, uh, say, uh, approach to code generation. Okay, so uh, about performance. So, so we did some experiments. So here you see three different uh, types of simulated simulations, just to demonstrate particles on this, uh, like particles discrete simulation, mesh continuous, and also a hybrid one. Um, and this is just a very simple scalability analysis on, on the multi-core. Um, just to see if we are how close are we from the performance of the manually written code by, by Pietro, I believe. So you see here actually very similar performance. So that's that's kind of you know, um, with less lines of code, like 73 lines of code in the DSL versus 580 lines of code in the C library. And, and so here what is what is hidden behind these numbers is that these 500, 580 lines of code of C are of course way more complex than the 73 lines of codes of the DSL. But that's also to be taken into account. Here we see that um, our uh, compiler was not so good. So here our, the performance that was created by our code, the code that we generated, uh, was not as good as the manual, uh, manually optimized code. But in this case, we, we could find out what, what happened. So at the end, we, we, our compiler missed the opportunity to fuse the loops to improve locality. So this is just to say that can, can be done. It's just a matter of adding more optimizations to the compiler. It's not a fundamental problem of the abstraction because that's something that um, in, in this kind of work is very important. You don't want to, or at least I don't want to introduce abstractions that prevent optimizations because that might happen. And actually in, in, in the community of domain specific languages, there's a lot of people that are interested in productivity, reducing the lines of code that you have to write, without so much a concern of performance. Right? So there's actually, if you talk to different people in the community, some of them will tell you that if you introduce abstractions, you will lose performance, right? And that's what I called before the abstraction toll, right? You introduce an abstraction, but you sacrifice performance because you have something that is easier to write. And that's something that we don't have to, we don't want to sacrifice on performance. And so for us, it's always very interesting to, to find out, is it that we are now, in, in, unable to exploit these optimizations because we have an abstraction that um, preclude, preclude those optimizations. And so far as we haven't, we haven't found that and, and that's, that's kind of good news for us. 
Okay, so um, going time. Uh, I think I'm slower than expected. Yeah, so so uh, something that I, that we did also with Evo was now that we have this DSL, uh, in the DSL you can, it is explicit what kind of method you want to use for the discretization. And so here we see DCPSE, DSV, and SPH. Uh, what those are, you guys know probably better than I. Um, and so the, the, the point here is that we know what is the convergence uh, behavior of those models. So we don't know maybe the constants, that define how the error converges, but we know what is the what is the asymptotical uh, convergence of those of these of these numerical kernels or these numerical approximations. Um, so what we did in, in, in this publication was to kind of use those models for the error uh, to do auto tuning at runtime to improve the model parameters. And so uh, this plot is a little bit difficult to read, uh, but what you see here is the performance of our auto tuning solution. Um, which is here by, I don't know, uh, what is it? Yeah, 10,000 seconds. And we were comparing with like model oblivious auto tuners. So this is actually an auto tuning framework, like instead of the auto tuning framework, with a bunch of different algorithms, like genetic algorithms, uh, particle form optimizations. And so these, these algorithms, they do not know what's, what's going on. So if you don't give them enough time for the exploration, for instance, you take this one here. Uh, the performance of the of the generated code is going to be yeah one point one point five orders of magnitude or maybe even two orders of magnitude slower than the one that we can produce. So these are kind of optimizations that are opened up to the compiler that are of course impossible from a C implementation. From a C implementation, it's going to be impossible for the compiler to understand. Oh yeah, this is actually this PSC. So if it is this PSC, I know that this is the convergence error. So maybe I can I can do a search on the on parameter H to find a a good trade off between performance and errors. Okay, so let me skip over that. Let's go to the second example of these cells. So this is on tensors. This is kind of the one that I was showing at, at the beginning without explicitly telling you that. So this is this interpolation kernel we had at the beginning. And this is a project that we started with Jochen Frölich at Tiertressen. So he's doing these kind of simulations. And of course we were doing tensors. So yeah, so like an, it was natural also to extend to some of the machine learning uh, into the frameworks that are out there. Um, so yeah, so now if you want to write this abstraction, this, 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 this kernel, you could write it in C++ and we saw code for that before, or you could write it in, in this instantiation of our DSL. So this is a DSL that we embedded into Fortran, so to speak. So this, this was then, uh, people could use it from Fortran. Uh, this is kind of this expression, this, is this expression here, generalized with some constants and uh, adding another tensor here. Um, but there is also a C++ instantiation of this DSL. So this is this, this side here is also expressing something similar here. I'm just using three different uh, tensors, but in principle, uh, this, the syntax is kind of the same. Um, and with this, with, this, with this DSL, actually the code that I showed you before that was 100 times faster than the naive code, this code was actually automatically generated by the compiler and matched uh, the code that was written by hand and often uh, actually outperformed the code that the people uh, in Jochen Frolich's group had been uh, maintaining for many years. So it's a fourth one code basis that was maintained by, for many years, adapting it to the, to the newer versions of the CPUs, the Intel CPUs, and so on and so forth. So we, we were able to generate a similar code. Um, and the reason why it is possible to do that is because now we, we know algebraic properties of those tensor expressions, like associativity, distributivity, that, that kind of things, but also um, fancier transformations. And so from, from that DSL that you saw before, we could actually create all these compiler variants. So every graph that you see here is a different C++ implementation of the same operator. And um, so I guess I hope you can see that, that these are compiler graphs that are even further simplified compared to the previous compiler graphs that I showed you before. And I, I think if you have some background compilers, you would know like you, you, you would know how, how difficult it is to implement this kind of transformation. So it's very difficult to, to, to transform from, graph, from one graph, say this one over here. And so if you give this to the compiler, because that's basically what you're doing when you write CC code, but you give this graph to the compiler, it's very difficult for a compiler to implement transformations to maybe bring it into this graph. Because there are data uh, transformations, there is a lot of control from transformation that are required to do these kind of things. Whereas from a DSL, it's very easy to generate. And so for us, it's very easy to generate these different variants and explore the space of potential optimizations. 
Um, so we extended this with um, some meta programming aspects as well. So what you put here is some results from a couple of years ago where we compared it with um, like the state of the art polyhedral compilers. So it's a very, um, very elaborated compiler methods. But in some cases, again, here, we're, we're, we're able to beat us. So we are here the red ones. Um, but also here, and I think I have some, yeah. So in, in compared to Pluto, we also verify that actually those implementations that the Pluto compiler were, were, uh, was doing, those transformations, could actually be reproduced in our abstractions. So we're not really losing potential. It's just that Pluto is a compiler that has been maintained by many years. Our compiler is just a prototype, right? So that's why it was easier. Sometimes, like here, for instance, our compiler was able to produce code that was better than the Pluto uh, code. And in, in some of these cases, we realize that it's because we can make algorithmic transformation. So now we can maybe rewrite an expression uh, with transposed matrices to improve the performance. And that's something that you cannot expect a, a, a traditional compiler to do. Here also you see a comparison with TensorFlow. Uh, this was at the beginning of TensorFlow. And so TensorFlow was not doing very well, as, as you can see here. And in some cases, it was actually uh, not possible to write this, for instance, this generalized convolution for the Helmholtz operator. Uh, we, we actually couldn't write that in TensorFlow because the, the abstractions were for machine learning, of course, not for, not for this kind of uh, kernels. OK, so, uh, so this is something that we are exploiting today in the um, European project. And uh, so we have modernized our compilers. We're heavily relying on a compiler, uh, like a high-level compiler infrastructure that is called MLIR, or multi level Intermediate Representation. This was something that was a project within Google that is now open source. It's a very interesting compiler framework because it allows us, like people like me or people like co colleagues in, in around the world that are defining these new abstractions, it allows us to encode these abstractions and in MLIR they are called dialects. It allows us to encode those dialects into a common compiler framework. And there's a lot of traction in this compiler framework. So you see that the major companies uh, contributing to this MLIR infrastructure, mostly driven by machine learning again. But that's going to be very cool because it, this will allow us, or it allows us already uh, to reuse backends for GPUs, right? So if, 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 if I'm able to write like my abstraction here uh, for the com computation free dynamic code, and uh, now I'm able to map it to this dialect, which is called Linux for linear algebra. Um, now I can profit from all the backends that people have already written from the linear algebra abstraction down to modern GPUs or modern um, modern uh, FPGAs. So that's something that that I think is a very important um, development in the last two three years in the area of compilers that will allow to have a lot of convergence between DSLs, uh, cross domain optimizations, and the like. And that's something that we are leveraging in this uh, European project. We've been working, as so I show you results for, for CPUs. We've been working this project particularly on, on complex FPGA systems. So I think that's what comes afterwards, how we, how we do this. Uh, here again, it's an expression of this interpolation operator, operator uh, with some notation here for the indexes, so which indexes are contracted, which, which indexes. Um, and now uh, via, in, in this MLIR context, we can do factorizations of these expressions. So this is just a simple example that fits in slide. And what this means is that now we can maybe pipeline those operator, operators so that we can stream the execution of those operators in an FPGA fabric. And that's something that actually brought a lot of um, computational throughput, as I will show you in the results. That is a, a rather technical slide. Uh, but the purpose of this slide is to show that within MLIR, we can encode transformations uh, so this is actually uh, this is actual MLIR code. So this is actual intermediate representations for our for our DSL. So this is tensor intermediate language is a product of these two things, uh, and so on and so forth. And so now we can uh, we can program transformations, like for instance using commutativity and distributivity, into something that uses a, a, a diagonalized matrix and so on and so forth. And, and these are the kind of optimizations that we have uh, built in uh, the compiler to optimize code. OK, so um, let me yeah, let me briefly mention what this colorful figure here is. So, so this is, again, um, a, a similar expression, so like a, a tensor expression. Again, I, I think this is the Helmholtz operators. It's a, a little bit more complicated 
tensor um, kernel. And um, what you see here is actually a graph that is exported by the compiler, expressing what kind of data structures are involved in this computation and what is kind of the, the liveness of those buffers. And so from, from this representation, we have collaborated with people that generate hardware. Uh, so there's a tool from Polytech Politecnico di Milano that is called Nemozyme. And now they can use the thing that the compiler produces to instantiate a kernel-specific memory subsystem on the FPGA. So that's actually very interesting because now we can reuse the, uh, the memories on an FPGA fabric so we can feed a lot of uh, these accelerators in, in that fabric. Um, so that's that's cool. So I'm going to skip over these results. So let me talk about these results because these are um, kind of more recent. And what you see here in this in this plot first is the the giga flops um, plot. So higher is better. And these are different optimizations that the compiler did. Okay. So uh, and then here with 16 giga flops, that was kind of the, the implementation on an Intel CPU. So this is kind of a, a, the software version, if you want. All these other versions are on. The and what you see here is that if you if you do not do much, so if you take the C code and throw it into the FPGA compiler, uh, you will be using a, a huge FPGA, but it's going to be actually what is it uh, five times slower than the Intel CPU, right? So the message here is, is as I was saying before, it's difficult to optimize for a CPU. It's even more difficult to optimize for a, for a for an FPGA. So even if this code is already factorized and everything, so we have uh, it's not, we're not studying here with the naive code. Uh, it's already a, a, a good code for a CPU. That code on an FPGA is actually not very efficient. And so here we, uh, we, we go through a series of, of optimizations, and, and some of those are just briefly described before, like for instance, breaking those kernels into data flows, reusing memory within the FPGA, and you get up to here 44. Uh, or 43 in the, in the entire system, 43 gigaflops, which is already um, two point something times faster than the Intel baseline. And of course, since, since now we have a DSL, we can actually play with the number representations. So we try different number representations. And of course, now if you, if you move from double to fixed point and uh, fixed point 32 bits, you get huge improvements in terms of um, flops. Um, the other part of the story here is the efficiency part, right? So. I care about efficiency a lot, like energy efficiency of computations. I think that's that's, a, that's an interesting area of research. Um, and especially if you're, if you're going for emerging technologies, these emerging technologies are usually more energy efficient. Also the case of FPGAs. So here you see an, an estimation of the energy efficiency of the Intel implementation uh, in terms of gigaflops per watt. Um, and most of these implementations here are higher, right? So for instance, up to 20 times uh, higher or 30, 25 times higher in terms of energy efficiency. And so what you see here are the different kind of architectures on the FPGA for different polynomial degrees and, and a different amount of accelerators. So here, for instance, this one would have three accelerators running concurrently within the FPGA fabric. There's a lot of interesting variants that we can explore automatically because we start from a high level um, abstraction. Okay, so where are we going with this? So this is something that is, on the making, so this is something that in the Everest project we are collaborating with the Shima Institute. So they work with this WORF, uh, this WORF uh, modeling framework for for weather simulations. And there we have isolated some kernels, especially in the radiation module. And we're looking at and, and some of those operators can also be written as the tensor expressions that our DSL understands. So that's something that we are working uh, towards. Um, this is just a kind of to get some input from some of you, if some of you know Worf. So it's a very complex kind of insert structure. And here's where we are getting a little bit of um, experience about what is the best way to interface DSLs with a complex frame, Fortran framework like, like Worf uh, actually is. Okay, so let me um, change, change tracks a little bit for a minute. I, I promise that I want to say something about emerging technologies and emerging, for instance, in-memory computing. So what you see here um, on, the, on the left hand side, this is a figure from a paper in Nature uh, a couple of years ago from IBM in Zurich. And uh, so this is a, a emerging memory technology that is called phase change memory, PCM. And so there are commercial products with PCM for Intel, for instance. 
Um, in PCM, like computing within the memory is something that is only that exists only in prototypes. So they have built a prototype with 500,000 of these memory cells. So now this memory cell, um, right, if, if you know DRAM, in DRAM, a memory cell is a condensator, a capacitor. In PCM, the memory cell is a memory store. And so the, the nice thing about, about these, these cells is that now you, what you could imagine is that it's, you, you store in this weight, in this resistor, in this, in this resistor, you store the weight of a neural network. Okay? So in analog, so you put here an analog value that corresponds to the weight of a neural network. Now, if you put the addresses into this memory, so these are the addresses of the memory. Now, think of the addresses as also analog voltages. So what happens is that you put the analog voltages here, they go through these uh, resistances, which are in parallel. And so what you end up getting here at the bottom is a current that is proportional to the dot product of the inputs and the weights. So this architecture in principle allows to do matrix matrix multiplication in constant time, because it's, it's done in the analog domain. So that's what people call in-memory computing, right? So you are using the memory to store the weights, but you don't have to bring the weights through the caches all the way to the arithmetic units, to the CMD units, to do the computation. Now, what you do is you move the data to the memory as addresses, and the result of that addressing operation is that you get the result, in this case, a matrix matrix um, product. So it's a very interesting technology. And, and like this, this is with PCM, there's also resistive memories. Like, like this, there's a lot of proposals out there. And there's been prototypes that show that the energy efficiency of this kind of designs are off the roof, right? Like you get like three times um, the, the energy efficiency. But, but the weights are fixed. It, you, can, you can reprogram them. It's just like writing memory. Okay. Yeah, so, so the, the question, oh, no, the microphones are all over the place. Yeah, so the weights, yeah, so, so it's a memory, so you can store the weights into the memory. So you can actually train also in CT. Yeah. Uh, so most of these people also do training with the device because the device has imperfections and so on. So you have to kind of include those imperfections of the device in the training. Um, but our problem is indeed that um, memory devices have an endurance issue, and right? you cannot write them so often, like, like flash. Right? So if you write them very often, they start to degrade. So that's an issue that these systems have to deal with. And so there's a plenty of issues, but I think it's, it's anyway a promising technology. Um, so I, I, I showed you this, this, this cartoon before. These are um, magnetic nanowires. And this comes from the, from the history of CFAD. Right? We were looking into these emerging technologies and how they will um, maybe change the game in, in computing systems. So this is uh, racetrack memory. So I'm maybe not going to go too much into the details here. But the, the message here is that you can also do in RTM computing with different kinds of primitives. Um, so for me, the, from the compiler perspective, I think this is a very interesting area of research because you can kind of get this, uh, these new, new primitives that you can execute in the memory. So you, don't, you kind of offload that from the processor core. Um, and so we understand these dot products. We don't understand how you can implement nonlinear functions with these devices. Uh, we understand some of the things that you can do in RTM and maybe other types of memories with ferro electric fits. Uh, but it's kind of something that I'm right now uh, very interested in pursuing is how can we abstract from those different in-memory computing primitives so that we can build compilers that transparently use them as well. And so we did that uh, a little bit. So for, for in PCM computing, I mentioned MLIR before. And so what we did is that we, as I mentioned at the beginning, right, like this, this in PCM computing have been driven mostly for machine learning because it's a matrix matrix multiplication. So it's, it's uh, machine learning is full of those, right? You can turn uh, convolutions into matrix matrix multiplications. So yeah, um, but what we, what we said is can we also build a compiler that is able to transform a code. So that we can also use that accelerator, even if it is just not a, a, a default uh, deep neural network. And so we started here from also like a tensor abstraction language. Uh, this was actually tensor comprehension because we were collaborating here with people that um, Facebook. So tensor comprehension is kind of a Facebook comp, uh, machine learning framework. And um, so within MLIR, we implemented uh, analysis and compiler passes uh, here, for instance, that allows us to 
transform the code so we can actually target that accelerator, right? So, so we can automatically put some code on the CPU and some, some code or some computation will be actually executed on the in-memory accelerator. These are basic simulations and, and yes, so it works. So this is actually what this plot shows uh, for the for the obvious cases like matrix matrix multiplication. So you get here, as I was saying before, a couple of orders of magnitude improve in terms of execution time. So here you compare the black one with the greenish bluish. And so we also implemented some device specific transformations. Uh, and you see that with those device specific transformations, you, you get the performance uh, further uh, down. And yeah, so there are some kernels here, like for instance, LSTM that is not very heavy on matrix matrix multiplications. And that's why once you once we pass it through the accelerator, actually we, lo we lose performance, but with the optimization, we were able to gain performance back. Again. So here again, a very interesting kind of compiler uh, approach in which you can generalize and you're able to use this accelerator for um, kernels in, in general. Uh, and this is the energy plot, so in terms of joules. And here in, in case of the obvious cases, you see huge um, energy gains um, by using the accelerator. Okay, so that's that's all that I wanted to tell you today. So um, what motivates my research, as I said, is the aim is ever increasing sense of complexity with this new type of domain-specific computing systems and how can we maybe target them and uh, optimize for them from um, domain-specific abstractions. So I do think, as I said before, that there's a lot of uh, important work to be done to continue on uh, optimizing compilers, traditional optimizing compilers, high-level synthesis, and, and so on. Um, we touch upon some things that you can achieve with higher semantics. Um, in terms of productivity, I think that's obvious. It's easier to write something that looks like a mathematical equation than it is to write 500 lines of code or fork of an optimized fork. Um, and I think these, these uh, abstractions will be even more important as we move into, into these emerging accelerated systems. And I think that's why also TensorFlow and these frameworks are doing that because they have also their own accelerators and they, they want to be able to target them efficiently. Okay, so uh, that's more or less it. Like moving forward, very interested in this convergence through the MLIR framework that I mentioned before for cross-domain optimizations. Um, as I mentioned, abstractions over in-memory computing primitives across different technologies, because there's a lot of different technologies that have been proposed for, for this kind of um, for this kind of computations. And um, yeah, and I, I think better connection to activity-oriented frameworks with this, I mean. How can we target these things from, from Python because everybody uses Python? So it's transparent for people using Python or for people using R. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you. So this is more or less my group right now. I think there are some phases that need to be updated. Um, also funding, and I listed hopefully most of the collaborators. Yeah. Um, thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to take some questions. <laughs>